Welcome our guest to the uh, Astronomy Podcast. I'm your host, Tristan Uso, and today we are going to be welcoming a former astronaut, Dr. Sandra Magnus. How are you? How are you, Sandy? I am doing great, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you again because we had so much fun in our rehearsal. Yeah, the two <laughs> of them were. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess we'll start out by, like, of course, you're an astronaut, and we know since a kid, you've always aspired to be that. What mm -hmm. what started your passion to become an astronaut? You know, I was a really curious uh, young person. I always was asking the question, why? Why does it, things work like this? Why do things work like that? I, I think I drove my parents a little crazy because they bought me a book called 200 Questions Why. Um, I was an avid reader. I really liked um, exploring things and learning new things. I really liked science and math. And the idea of flying in space and seeing our planet from space just caught my imagination and I never let go. Okay. Um, so what were your like, well, how young were you when you decided like an astronaut would be so cool? Yeah, so I was in middle school. I can't remember if it was, you know, seventh or eighth grade, but it was sometime during my middle school educational phase that the idea just sort of stuck to me. Okay. Um, so what was, um, what's the plan in order to become a national? Like what are the steps that you had the research find out and then go for it to become an astronaut? Yeah, I knew it was important to have some kind of a science or technology or engineering or math degree. And when I made my plans, you know, going into high school, how I was going to tackle this, I was focused on studying physics because um, of all the sciences, that was my favorite one because it was really good about answering the question why. And so I had this idea that I would get a bachelor's in physics and a master's in physics and a PhD in physics and I apply to the astronaut office. And um, when I got to college, you know, I got my bachelor's degree in physics and then I discovered engineering, which I had no exposure to as a student in high school. And so I didn't even know engineering was a thing. And and I'm like, oh, wow, well, engineering is really cool too because you can take the science and the principles of science and using math, apply that to build stuff. And so then I, I kind of wandered off my original plan and studied electrical engineering at my master's. And then I discovered as I was working in my first job, I discovered the field of material science, which is kind of a mixture of science and engineering. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I'm gonna do my PhD in that. And that, uh, when I finished that PhD, uh, I decided it was time to apply to NASA because I had a pretty decent resume because I'd worked for a while and I finished my education and uh, and it was time to apply. Okay. Um, all right. Well, how did the process go from there on when you decided to apply for an astronaut? What happened after? Yeah. So what happens when NASA is ready to select astronauts? They, they put a call out, you know, on, on social media or online and say, hey, we're ready to select an astronaut class. And they select astronauts as a class, you know, it's not just individuals from time to time, but a, a group of people at one time and basically invite applications. And so anybody can apply. And then they screen the applications for people who they think have the high qualifications. And if you get into the high qualifications, they ask you to, to get a, a basic flight physical to make sure that you're healthy. And then they email letters of reference to your rep, people that you have as your references. And then after they've gathered all that information, they decide who they want to interview. And they usually interview about 120 people. And the interview process is not just a normal interview, you know, where you talk to people and they talk to you and try and figure out who you are as a person. But there's a lot of medical, uh, medical testing during that interview week. And then they decide who to select. And, um, and during the shuttle era, they were selecting usually groups of 20 or, or 22. My year, they decided they needed about 35 people. So the year I got selected in 1996, I, I just hit the right time when they needed a huge number of people. So my the odds of me getting selected were, were greater. But um, nowadays, they're selecting about 10 every time they need a class because the flight manifest rate's gone down since the retirement of the shuttle. But, but then I got selected in 1996, and I started my basic training. How often do they um, recruit classes for mm -hmm. uh, to become astronauts how often did they do the recruiting period yeah while we were flying space shuttles it was about every two years because they needed a lot of people because every shuttle can can hold about seven five to seven people and they were flying five to six shuttles a year these days they rec they're recruiting about every four years 
And um, they're recruiting about 10 people because the capsules that fly people back and forth to space station only hold, a, uh, you know, three people or four people. And then you stay on space station for six months or so. So the missions are longer and there's kind of fewer throughput, if you will. So they need fewer people than what we had in the era that I was an astronaut. Okay. So, um, so far, like in the narrative of your life to become an astronaut, after you applied, did they uh, call you back? Or how yeah. did they get in touch with you? Yeah. So they called me for the interview and I went down and interviewed and, and I had to wait for them to interview everybody. Right. So they could figure out who they wanted. And then they called me to tell me I got selected. And that was super exciting. And then um, they call, I got that call in April of 1996 and the start date was in August of 1996. And so then I moved to Houston and started my basic training. How, uh, how many years of preparation did it take just to become like qualified to become like accepted as an astronaut? Yeah, our basic training is about two years. And so we learn a lot in those two years. I remember walking into my office that first day and there was a stack of books that was probably about three feet high. And that was all the material that I had to learn. It was all the space shuttle systems. I had to learn to fly T-38 uh, trainer jets. I had to learn the space station systems. I had to learn robotics. I had to learn spacewalks. I had to learn how to do photography. I had to learn some life science. I had to learn some geology. I mean, there was just Russian language. I mean, just a huge variety of things that we learn in those two years that gives us the foundation knowledge that we need in order, as you, as you pointed out, to be eligible for our first flight assignment where we train after we get assigned to a flight, we train for, for shuttle missions. We train another year for the specific things that we're going to do on the mission. And for space station, we train, in my case, it was four and a half years, but over the, over time, we've learned how to squish the space station training down from a four year training flow to a two year training flow. So nowadays people train for about two or two and a half extra years for space station assignments. Hmm. So it was four and a half years of it. Through that time, uh, how did that affect you as a person? Were you like very excited? Were you passionate about it? Oh, yeah. I mean, at the end of my training flow, I was going to get to go stay in space for four and a half months. And it was like being it's like being in school. Right. I mean, we had a schedule of our classes and our classes were a mix of of classroom and hands on and simulate simulations with mission control and with the other crews. Um, and so it was really a lot like being in school, except that I had to train for space station. We train all over the world. So I was training in Russia. I was training in Canada. I was training in um, Europe. I was training in Japan. So there was a lot of travel involved. And that was probably the most exhausting thing about being in space station training at the time. They've, they've gotten, like I said, they've streamlined it a little bit over the years. But when I was training, it, my schedule was a month in Houston, a month in Moscow, a month in Houston, two weeks in Canada, a month in Moscow, a month in Houston, three weeks in Japan, two weeks in Europe, a month in Houston. And so that was my that was my life for wow. several years. So it was really exhausting doing all yeah. that traveling constantly, never settling in one place. Yeah, it was easier to be on the space station for four and a half months where you're like, you know, in one spot and not moving. I mean, really. So what were some of the most uh, like surprising like things you learned about the world through all that traveling, seeing all the separate cultures, because I know it's going to play into a part when you're come on to the international space station. Oh, absolutely. Cause the crews are international, right? I mean, our crew, we were the last three person crew on the station and our job was to make the station ready for six person crew, which is what it was designed for. So our crew was two Americans and a Russian. And up until that point, the crews were either two Russians and American or two Americans and a Russian. And we went to six person crews. There were Japanese and Europeans of various nationality and Canadians in the mix with the Americans and the Russians. So it really was an international crew. And I, I personally, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in Southern Illinois, a small town. I never imagined that I would be living and working all over the world. And I remember the first time I was in Moscow and I was standing there and in red, I was standing there looking at the Kremlin. It's like, I'm in Red Square. This is so weird. I never imagined that I could be, you know, living in another country like this. But it was really fun. And you do you do learn a lot about, you know, the world and, and you learn that basically people are the same no matter where they live. And you learn to appreciate differences in culture. You learn to appreciate what it, what the U.S. culture is and what it means because, you, you know, it's hard to 
understand your own culture when you're in it all the time, but you, you know, I'm in another country and I see it reflected in how I, I, I engage with others. So it was, a, it was a really wonderful experience to be able to, to live in all these different countries like that. Hmm. Is there anything, um, for all that traveling, uh, that, um, is there anything that made you like really appreciate the United States specifically as a country or maybe even prefer another to it? You know what, you know what our strength is? And it was really obvious to me, you know, listening when I was taking my Russian class, for example, in Russia, it was really obvious to me that our country is it, the diversity in our country. You know, the fact that we have people from all over the world that live in our country and, and we're all sort of Americans, you know, we all identify as Americans because we all buy into the values and the, and the, uh, the principles and ideals that we live by, regardless of our ethnic origin. And we're because we're such a diverse nation, and we have so many different, um, you know, lenses on how to live. We we have a lot of flexibility in how we approach things, which is why we're so powerful as a nation. Let me give an example. When I was in Moscow and I was taking Russian class, my teacher we were using Russian history as the way for me to learn Russian, and she was talking about their history back in you know AD 900. The Mongol hordes came down off the steppes and invaded invaded Russia all the way up to the Moscow gates and were defeated and, you know, and then they, they went away. And she went on to say something, and I paraphrased, then, you know, we still have, we still have people, you know, we still have, you know, the Mongol, Mongol people here in Russia. And I'm looking at her like, isn't a thousand years enough for them to be considered Russian? You know, the fact that, that someone, you know, a, a group could be living there and not be considered Russian because they originally a thousand years ago came from somebody else somewhere else was was mind boggling to me because here in the in the in the U.S. I mean if you if you're an American you're an American and you just happen to have an an ethnicity of of something different but it it was it was a little bit like the inflexibility right and then you see these parts of the world that are that are where these these long standing tensions exist because something that happened 400 or 500 years ago and and we're we, we we're a lot more flexible than that and another example if you don't mind me continuing another example uh, I had a roommate uh, in my an office mate in graduate stu school he was from the Dominican Republic and he he made a comment about how flexible we were as a culture and and I was like well what are you talking about and he said well you know we went from the civil rights movement in the 60s to have an African-American president like, you know, 30, 40 years later. And that never would have happened in any other country. Hmm. To, he, to him, that was just amazing that we could move that fast. Now, does that mean that we've solved all of our problems or we're perfect? No. But when you get out of the country and you see some of these other cultures and, and how some of these these ideas sit there and you realize that we actually are a pretty flexible and the strength of that is the diversity of ideas that percolate all over our country. And, and so that was a really interesting perception shift, you know, cause we're in it all the time and we see all the problems and all the, all the issues that we rightfully have to work through. But from the outside looking in, we're, we're incredibly dynamic and flexible and, and, uh, and, and rich. Uh, well, while you're thinking, let me, let me just point out, you know, when, when you get in space and you look down at the planet, right, you see, it's, it's, you know, just like when I left the country and I started to experience other cultures, I, I kind of viewed the world differently, right? When I left the world and I looked down on the world, right, that's yet another perception shift, right? So now I'm outside of the planet, not just outside of the United States, but outside the planet and looking down and you realize, wow, you know, it's one spaceship and we're all crewmates on this spaceship. And we have to be able to work as a team and we we're not at that point as a species where we know how to do that and 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 i look at how we're trying to sort out our differences in the united states and again we're not perfect we have a lot of things to work out we're like a little microcosm of the globe right because as a as a global human society we have to figure out how to work together because we're all on, on this one spaceship and we and it's hard for people to experience the earth that way because all your experience is just local you know and but when you get out of it and you look down on it it's like huh it's like one thing huh. you know it's one thing it's not this country or that country or this culture or that culture or this continent or that continent it's it's one one thing and it's it's it's, it's an experience and it really hits you hard so you realize they're all connected rather than <laughs> separate 
Yeah, and, and it's so easy. I mean, we're very good at, uh, as a species, as using our differ our differences to draw lines. And those differences are like this tiny, right? And, and we're not so good yet as a species of understanding the things that we have in common. You know, like everywhere I've traveled all over the world, people are fundamentally nice people. They're fundamentally helpful people. They're fundamentally people who are trying to just live their best life, right? And, and that's no matter where I've been, whatever culture I've been in, in whatever manner they're trying to do that. It's, we're all, we all, those, those likenesses are much stronger than these differences that people choose to emphasize. And it's very unfortunate. Hmm. How does that um, play out like on the International Space Station? Like when y'all are like on a mission while in space serving a certain role, like how does that cultural diversity come into a way? Because I know since during like different, they have very different environments, very different cultures. And I imagine that gives them an incredibly different perspective and way of thinking of things. Like how does that work in problem solving when you're on the IS? Is it like really incredible or is it like, Oh God, it's so slow. I wish they spoke my English. Well, you know, it, it's when, so first of all, in on the crew, you know, we've trained together for years, right? So we know each other. It's like having a second family. We know each other really well. So we can work problems out really well. And, and on the space station, we speak English and Russian. Those are the two languages up there. And we just go back, you know, when I was up there, we were using both languages equally because we all had the same language skills across across each other. So in small teams like that, that know each other really well, you know, you can work through problems because we've had two years to kind of mm. understand each other as people. And, and the cultural piece isn't quite as strong because we know each other with a direct one-to-one -one relationship that was that's very strong because we've, you know, bounced all over the world training together. In bigger groups of people, you get to like the United Nations or some of these other international groups, your comment about, oh, things move so slow is a true statement, right? Because these people don't know each other as well, although they know each other, they know each other pretty well if they've been working for 20 years in the United Nations together. But there's all these other agendas that play into it. And the and and what's really important to get through these cultural differences is communication. And by communication, I mean really, really listening to what the other person is saying and trying to understand what they're saying in their cultural context. So the first time I went to Russia and and I was listening, you know, I, I speak Russian, you know, but I learned more and more, uh, you know, I got more and more fluency over time and we use translators. And so I would listen very carefully to what the translator was saying and I would, and try very carefully not to listen to it through my US cultural context. I tried to understand the Russian cultural viewpoint. And when I spoke, I tried very carefully not to use jargon or slang to speak clear English. So, you know, thinking about communication skills is very important when you're doing cross-cultural types of discussions. So are you saying you spoke like very logically and exact rather than abstract, like figuratively speaking? Yes, metaphors can be very, you know, we have a lot of, metaphors and similes and like sayings and phrases that that are not quite slang but there's there's a cultural context around them right so i was trying very carefully and we were speaking technically too so that makes it easier because technical language is a little more precise but you, know, you have to be very careful about using uh, uh, phrases that have a lot of you know like if i refer to a phrase from a pop culture tv show right they wouldn't get it no clue and it doesn't translate. You know, it translates literally like, what'd you just say? <laughs> so communication and having really good communication skills, which means listening, speaking clearly, trying to put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand what they're saying is, that's actually an important life skill, but it's really important when you're doing cross-cultural work. After you finished your training, like what was it like on your first launch off into space? I was so excited. You know, I was I was 36, right, when I launched for the first time. And I'd been dreaming about going to space since I was 11 or 12. So here I was like, ah, I'm finally getting to go. This is so exciting. And so, um, you know, to, to do a launch, you basically, you know, you put on your, your orange launch and entry suit, right, in crew quarters, and they put you in the van. You drive out to the launch pad a few hours before launch, and the, the closeout crew basically helps strap you into your seat. Remember, you're sitting on your back facing up, right? And so you hurry up and get out there so they can shut the hatch and leave, the closeout crew can leave the pad. And now you're waiting 
you know, for the rest of the launch countdown to go. So it's kind of like a hurry up and wait. And you're kind of laying there and laying there, listening to launch control team, you know, do their thing to get the rocket ready. And then, you know, about uh, launch minus 10 minutes, things start to seem to pick up, right? So T minus two minutes, we close the, the visors on our helmets. So we're on internal oxygen. And uh, at T minus six seconds, the shuttle main engines uh, ignited. And that was about a million pounds of thrust. Now we're not going anywhere yet because because we what they want to do is they want to make sure the shuttle main engines are working properly because they can be turned off if they're not, right? And they've actually had some pad aborts before where in that six seconds, the engines weren't working and they cut them off and the launch was aborted. But you can feel the stack sway because that's a million pounds of thrust and that energy has to go somewhere, but we're still fastened to the launch pad. So, it, so the shuttle sways a little bit and then at T equals zero, if the main engines are working okay, those two solid rocket boosters that are attached to the shuttle, they light. And once the solid rocket boosters light, you are going somewhere. Um, these, there's these big pyrotechnic bolts that, that uh, pyrotechnics that, that uh, split the bolts in half that are holding us the launch pad. And so 7 million pounds of thrust and whew, we're off the launch pad. It's a slow acceleration. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of vibration. There's some videos out there on YouTube that you can, you know, just like shuttle cockpit videos, you can type it and, and look at it. And that is it's like a lot of noise, a lot of vibration for about two minutes because during that two minutes, we're riding those solid rocket boosters. And after two minutes, all of that fuel is spent and those those solid rocket boosters, you again, pyrotechnically, you know, are separated from the orbiter. Now we continue to orbit on the shuttle main engines. Um, another six and a half minutes. So it's eight and a half minutes total to get to our, our first orbit at 100 miles. About 30, 45 seconds before main engine cutoff, we feel three Gs, you know, through our chest. So it feels like there's a 700 pound gorilla sitting on your chest. Mm. You kind of have to talk like this because you're forcing the air out of your lungs to talk. So we don't really talk much. But after that, then there's main engine cutoff, right? And now you're in your first orbit and now you're in zero gravity for the first time. And that was very fun because even though I was strapped into my seat, right? I could tell that I was floating and my butt wasn't sitting on anymore. I was kind of floating in the straps and I let go of my checklist with my procedure book in front of me. I let go and it stayed there and was floating. And I just started giggling because it was so cool. Right. really surprised you yeah it's hard to you know it's hard to imagine what zero gravity is like right i had no clue what it was going to be all about and, and to experience it and have that freedom of movement i mean if you take a second to look above your head and you see all the volume between you and the ceiling i mean in zero gravity that's you can use that space you're not stuck to the floor you can put your body in any orientation that you need it to be in to do your work so it was awesome all right. Um, what was like the first thing you done after finally like you landed on the International Space Station, right? Okay. Yep. Um, like what was your first thing you did like when you got there? Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we rendezvous and dock to the International Space Station. We dock at the front end and then we have to make sure the hatches are sealed appropriately before we open them up and, and go through. And the first thing I did was I took over some fresh food to the when I crossed the hatch, I took over some fresh food to the space station crew. <laughs> and then we had a, a little orientation, you know, and a safety brief for how to do, um, uh, you know, fire drills and stuff on the space station. And then we had a little public appearance thing with mission control and waved to hide everybody. And then we got to work. Yeah, we wow. got to work. What was it like um, moving with zero gravity? How was it? Like, is it really freeing and liberating or do you have to take it like super slow to be careful? Well, you do have to take it super slow to be careful at the very beginning, right? Because it's if you get if you move too fast, you can get out of control <laughs> really easily, right? And it's all about Newton's laws, right? It's you know, you know how a body in motion tends to go in motion unless it's acted on by an external force. That's one of Newton's laws. So usually the external force is a wall or something that you're running into, right? Because once you get moving in one direction, you're just gonna keep going. And so you, so you have to kind of start slow. Otherwise, you're, I mean, literally banging off the walls. And that's not good for the equipment. But once you get the hang of it, it's amazing how fast you can move. And and it's just, it's really super fun. It really is. Is it, um, is it preferable to gravity? Yes. <laughs> except, except, I will, I mean, except for keeping track of your stuff, 
right? I mean, look at the, the table behind you has those rockets on it and, and all of that stuff is staying there because gravity is holding it there. So if you can imagine, you know, you're like your bedroom at home or your, your school room, if there was no gravity, everything would be floating around everywhere. And so it's really easy to lose things in zero gravity because they just float off. So you have to be aware of, you know, Velcro, you know, use your Velcro. Duct tape is a good way to hold things in place. Bungees are a good way to hold things in place. Ziploc bags that have Velcro on it is a good way to hold things in place. I had to have zippers on the pockets of my pants so that things wouldn't float out of my pants. And so you have to be a little bit more disciplined about watching your stuff and, and keeping track of your stuff in space. And then the other thing is um, showers. You can't really take a shower in space. So I missed hot showers because I was taking sponge baths for the four and a half months while I was on space station, because showers are all gravity, right? If you had a shower in space, right? You turn on the faucet. When you turn on the faucet on earth, gravity forces the water out of the faucet over your head, right? If you mm. turn on a faucet just like that, you took you know, your bathroom faucet and put it in space, and you turn on the water, the water would come out of the faucet head and it would just stick to the faucet head and grow a bigger and a bigger and a bigger and a bigger bubble because there's no force forcing it down. So this thing called surface tension takes over and the surface tension makes it kind of stick to the faucet head. So no showers in space, so I missed hot showers. How does that exactly work with the um, water? Because I understand that um, in preparation for this, I watched one of your lectures on it. It was in Australia, 2015. I didn't fully watch it though. I didn't have the time. Very great energy, by the way. I absolutely loved it. It was so so much. Oh, thank you. I really I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, but I was really like, for starters, I'll ask this and I'll move more on to like, how does that work with the bubble? Is it hollow or is it completely filled up? No, it's completely filled up. Did you get? Did you find the video with me with the water on my hand? Yeah, I seen. Uh, okay. I seen it on the lecture. Yeah, you made a glove with it. Yeah. So, so this, this is a thing called surface tension, right? When, when you don't have gravity, if I had gravity, what gravity is a strong force and it would just pull it off my hand, right? Without gravity, this thing called surface tension takes over, which makes, for, for lack of better words, it makes liquids kind of sticky to things. And so that water was, that surface tension forces were holding it on my hand. Now I could overcome the surface tension forces if I moved my hand really fast, because that put a lot of energy into the system to, to build up, but very slowly I could do that water in the glove. So that's how all fluids behave in zero gravity. Huh? It's really cool, isn't it? You see yeah, that? It was very interesting. I have a, a personal question on it because I have a health condition that makes my hands sweat excessively. Mm. And I was a little curious. I was like, that don't seem too good in space. Yeah, it would yeah. stick to you. Like when I worked out on the bike or on the treadmill, I would sweat, but the sweat would just stick to me. It wouldn't, it wouldn't drip, right? When you when you sweat on earth, you drip. When I sweat in space, it just kind of sticks like in those little bubbles, right? Just like the water on my hand, it just kind of sticks. So I'd have to get a towel and, you know, towel myself off. Wow. Is there any risk to the equipment from the water that produces it? Like, do you have to like keep a towel on y'all at all times? Yeah, we, we, you know, we do try and be very careful about, you know, spreading our sweat everywhere. And when there's a water spill, the good thing is when there's a water spill, it does the same thing, right? It kind of sticks as a bubble. And so when you clean it up, you have to be very careful to kind of do it gently so you don't agitate it and get it sp spread around because then it will, you know, mm. spread around and then stick to whatever it attached and whatever, wherever it lands and falls. So, yeah. In the life of an astronaut on the ISS. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's both structured and unstructured, right? They know for each increment what tasks we want to do. And then there's, an, it's an international group actually that schedules our days, right? So we, they kind of break out. We want to get these things done during the mission, you know, that might be four or six months. And then each week to week, well, that means we've got to do these tasks. And so we'll get a schedule the night before, like say Sunday night, right? Sunday night, we'll get a schedule for, the, we'll get a look ahead for the whole week but we'll also get a very specific schedule for what they want us to do on Monday. And there'll be some flexibility in it, but generally they have our tasks laid out for us. And we go to bed and we get up. Um, you can kind of get up when you want to, as long as you're awake by the daily planning conference by 7.15 or 7.30 in the morning. We use Greenwich Mean Time. 
right? Because the control centers are all over the planet, right? There's a control center in Moscow. There's a control center outside of Munich. There's a control center in Houston and in Huntsville, Alabama. And there's a control center in Tokyo. And so they're all over the world in different time zones. So we're all synced up on Greenwich Mean Time. And so that's what we get up around. We have a daily planning conference around seven, sometime between seven and 7.30. And we go over the schedule. It's like, okay, anybody have any questions? We talk to all the control centers because we might have tasks coming from any one of the countries for any of their equipment. And so we clear up any questions and then we just start working to our schedule, right? It's somewhere in there we'll have some exercise on our schedule because we have to exercise every day. We have a break for lunch. Um, our crew tried to eat lunch together. Sometimes crews cannot, just depends on what's on the schedule because and how things overlap because you have to plan around, you know, where people are physically and things like that. And we work through the day. We have conversations with the ground during the day based on questions that come up or, you know, things, questions that they want. And the tasks can run from, you know, any kind of maintenance and repair, any kind of logistics work, any kind of science experiment or technology demonstration, robotics or EVA work, prep work for robotics or EVA, um, uh, public appearances where we're talking to schools or news people or something. So any, any, any of that can show up on any given day. And then at the end of the day, we have another planning conference with all of the control centers to kind of go over what happened during the day. You know, things might not have gotten done or we might have had problems. And then plan and just give us overview of what we're doing the next day. And that's usually around six o'clock or so in the evening. And then we're off for the rest of the night. And, you know, we eat dinner. People who have an exercise will exercise. People, we have um, the ability to use a satellite phone to call our families, or catch up on email, or watch movies, or take pictures of the earth. Or sometimes I would get ready for the next day because, you know, keeping track of stuff is hard, right? So I would want to find the tools I needed for the next day just to make sure I knew where they were. So there's all kinds of different things people did in the evenings. And then, you know, you went to bed whenever you've kind of felt like it. And then the whole thing would start over. Wow. So there's a lot of planning involved in IC. There's yes. A lot. Yes. There are whole teams of people that plan constantly. So I want to ask, like, um, the overall purpose of the ISS, I imagine, is primarily for, like, scientific studies, right? Like, any mm -hmm. tasks revolve with, like, revolving around, like, the state of the ISS and many, like, engineering aspects. They're primarily just there to set up activities they're going to do for scientific experiments, right? Right. We do scientific experiments and we do technology demonstrations, right? Because if you're designing technology that has to work uh, in zero G for future spacecraft, you want to actually try it in zero G, right? So it's a good test platform as well as a good scientific platform. Because we already talked earlier about how liquids change their behavior in space because there's no gravity. And there's other physical phenomena that that are, are manifest differently in space because of the lack of gravity. And so those are, you know, plants, plant experiments, fluid experiments, material experiments, biology experiments, combustion experiments. There's all kinds of different um, science experiments that we do on the space station without gravity, as well as the technology demonstration piece. Okay. They should bring a pelican to space. <laughs> but we've taken mice and bees and spiders and fish you know, small animals, right? How did the fish work? How does that work? Those were on a shuttle. Those were on a shuttle mission. I was not on that mission, but I was told that they kind of swam in loops. You know, so they they were kind of confused and swam in loops. I saw the mice. They had mice on my last mission, and it was really amazing. You know, the first day, so you can see through the cages, right? They're wire wire cages with plastic around them, so the mice could hold on to the wires. And what was really cute because right when we got, we checked them every day, right? So the first day we got to orbit and you look in the cage and the mice are like, what the heck is going on, right? With a few of them are pushing off and kind of floating through the cage and testing their environment. You know, so the adventurous, so you had the like scared mice and the adventurous mice. And then after about two or three days, you look in, you look in the cage and most of them are having a blast. They're like doing the little gerbil looking, bouncing from wall to wall, just bouncing around and, and really enjoying the zero gravity and there's still a couple of them that are like what the heck is going on you know so it was really fun to watch the mice adapt to zero gravity that's what i was going to mention like and i uh, never considered animals adapting this but that's really fascinating do you know yeah. how, 
you know, like the effects of it, like, have they ever done it long term with mice? Um, most of them have been up and down on the shuttle, you know, because th that's part of the experiment is how animals react to zero gravity. You know, you know, when we landed, I didn't get a chance to peek at them because they they do experiment. You know, I'm an animal. You know, we're animals as humans. Right. So the doctors are doing experiments on us as soon as we land because they want to see how our bodies have reacted you know, to zero gravity and how fast they adapt, readapt to, to gravity. And so I didn't get a chance to peek in the mice, uh, you know, on the way back. But based on how I felt when I came back into gravity, I imagine those mice were like, oh, my God, what just happened? You know. <laughs> so um, I want to touch back on it. It's just like a small question. But I know when you said you were when you were leaving the ash, sorry, the atmosphere, you had a three G's on your chest. Like, yeah, this is like a measure of how much pressure of gravity. Yeah, because we were acceler it's a, you know, we were accelerating uh, that fast and that the effective G's that we were feeling was three times normal because of the acceleration that we were feeling. But oh. actually, you know, when you fly a jet a jet aircraft, you know, doing aerobatics, you can feel more than three G's. You can get up to four or five or six. Some of the, the military pilots who do all the fancy, you know, air to air fighting stuff, they can get up to six to seven G's. Oh my God. T wow. Temporary, you know, not as long as we were feeling three G's, but just temporarily as you, as you pull a tight turn and you, you accelerate through a turn, you've been on a roller coaster. You've probably felt that before. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did y'all like, uh, how did the astronauts like when you are ever, sorry, my words get messed up. English is a hard language, even if it's the first. <laughs> How did y'all, um, like in your spare time, did y'all ever like play around with gravity? Like the same way the mice did, like jumping around? Oh, yeah. You know, you, there's a lot of pictures of astronauts doing somersaults and, you know, bouncing off the walls and playing with, you know, water droplets and throwing food at each other to play catch, you know. There's lots of, we do a lot of that stuff. Have y'all ever made any uh, like zero gravity games? Like I think some of, the, space? some of the space station crews have, you know, try, you know. But I, I didn't while I was up there, but I think some of the space station crews after me, some of the more recent ones, like in the last 10 years, have been goofing off. They've had like a base football up there and a baseball. And, you know, you can do some kind of fun, you know, have a hoop and try and get the ball through the hoop kind of things. Because it's hard to throw something in a straight line because because there's no gravity. Just the, a minute difference between the way your hand is angled has a big effect on the, the ball. You know, if you push off from the wall, you know, if you're two feet and you're trying to push, you know, like do a Superman fly and push straight off the wall. If you just have a little bit of different, a different force through one toe on one foot, it can angle you off in a weird direction. It would alter your trajectory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Um, is there any parts of the ISS that were the most interesting to you, like during your time up there? Well, um, the windows, clearly. Are one of the are the favorites, right? Because you get to see the Earth and and the your environment as you go by. And and now when I lived there, they didn't have it. But when I went back to visit on STS 135 a few years later, they had the cupola, which you can see pictures of if you Google the ISS cupola. It's basically this little bubble of windows that allows you, you know, instead of looking through a window where you have the porthole kind of effect, this was a, like a little porch, if you will, and you could get in it and you could see you know, 360 views of the earth as we're, as we're going by. That was absolutely amazing. That was amazing. That how was my amazing, favorite place. How amazing was it when, um, cause I know, um, say the earth, like the ISS rotates or uh, orbits around the earth. Mm -hmm. every 90 minutes. Yeah. And you'd have like a day and night every 45, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Like how incredible was it like watching that? Like, I, I guess you haven't been up there since to see the, uh, what did you say his name was again? The Aurora Borealis? Uh, the, the 360 the, window. Oh, the cupola. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, on STS 135 at night when everybody else was sleeping, I would go hang out in the cupola for 90 minutes. So I had the whole view to myself and it was just so beautiful. And my favorite, well, there's so, so many things, but the, the really cool thing was to go from day to night, right? Because you go from like a sky blue into a, a, a little bit of a darker blue, then navy blue, then a, then a midnight blue, then a blue purple, and then a purple black, and then a, you know, a purple gray, and then a gray black as you go from day to day. So it's like this whole rainbow of blue that just was below you in about 10 minutes. And if you're out in the west and you're in the desert or you're in some, some place where there's a huge sky, 
if you're paying attention and you look to one horizon where the sun is setting and you do the whole 180 view to the other horizon, uh, you can see the rainbow blue across the whole sky. But I saw it all in like a 10 minute compressed little band. And it was, it's absolutely beautiful. You mean like the spectrum of brightness to darkness? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's even better than being like in a huge, great desert is completely empty. Yeah. So and sometime when you're out in like an open area, like a desert where you can see the the whole horizon, pay attention to a sun, a sunset and look at the, the color, you know, the light to dark colors, you know, as you look across the sky. It's really amazing. Um, I want to ask because I know one part um, when I was watching your lecture, you mentioned looking out into I guess it was like, um, have you all ever um like have doors like on the ISS that make you, you put your space suit on. It's like a airlock. Yeah, there's, a, there's an airlock. Yeah. This, the shuttle had an airlock and the space station actually has uh, two airlocks for people and one airlock for equipment. Okay. So do y'all ever wear the suit and like go out and have like a bungee cord that attaches you and go yeah, out? Have, of it? Yeah. I have not, it's called doing a, a spacewalk. I have not done a spacewalk. I've trained for spacewalks, but I've never done one. And, um, but they do spacewalks. I wouldn't say regularly. What we try and do is wait until a bunch of stuff breaks and needs repairing. And then you kind of go out it and do it all at one time. Cause it's, it's still considered kind of a dangerous thing to do. And we don't just, you know, Oh, we're going to go outside today. You know, you have to plan it. It takes a lot of effort to plan one and then do one. Yeah. It'd be bad to reenter orbit and out of that way. Yeah. You don't want to do that. Yeah. That, would, that would be bad. Yes. Yeah. Become a shooting star. Yeah. Um, but I know you mentioned on it that um, you said like there was a unique look to the atmosphere. Like it was a very thin mm -hmm. layer and it looked different. Like what did, could you elaborate more on that? Yeah. It goes back to what we talked about before. You know, when I was talking about culture, there's a big difference between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge. Right. And so you, you can do the math and, and calculate how thin the atmosphere is. So for example, um, you know, Mount Everest, people climb Mount Everest, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, 29,000 feet and some change, you know, slightly over 29,000 feet. And you, you hear about people needing supplemental oxygen to climb Mount Everest because the oxygen layer is so thin up there. So it's already in the thin part of our atmosphere where there's no air, right? So the circumference of the earth is 25,000 miles and some change. So you think about, you know, something this big in miles with these little, which the tallest height is like 29,000 feet, right? So there's a big difference there. So that tells you right away that there's a thin atmosphere on our planet. So you can calculate it. But that's what I saw when I looked out the window the first time. I opened the Pale Bay doors of the shuttle, and there's two aft-facing windows in the shuttle bay that when you open the Pale Bay doors, you can see through the windows to the Earth. And I looked out the window, and our air layer was like this big on top of the Earth. It looks so thin, and it looks so fragile. And you know, you know that white dandelion fluff that you – you know, you blow on and they'll, yeah. yeah, it looked like you could do that to our atmosphere. You just blow on it and it would just float away. And it really, it really um, hit me, you know, again, experientially how fragile our planet is. And, and again, we don't experience it because we're, you know, we're hanging out at sea level all the time. There's all kinds of air above us. We think it's infinite, but you know, those people on Mount Everest don't think it's infinite. And again, it's only 29,000 feet off the, the surface of the planet. So it's not that high considering, you know, I was up at a couple hundred miles, right? So, yeah, our atmosphere, we, our planet looks very fragile, and we really can't take it for granted. Wow. So you're like kind of, so yeah, it's like going back to what you said, like the Earth is like a space shuttle, and we got to mm -hmm. take care of it, and it's not as, it's not like as invincible as we believe it to be or imagine it to be. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I'll, yeah. So, so it's, I find, I find some of these conversations about climate change a little amusing from the viewpoint of, of, oh, we have to save the planet. It's like the planet is going to continue to exist. The planet doesn't care whether there are people on it or not. Right. And, and so we're, you know, we need to take care of the planet for our own sake because it, it doesn't have to have people on it. And if we if we wreck the fragile ecosystem, you know, the planet will continue, but just perhaps without us. So it's not really to me an issue of climate change. It's an issue of this is our spaceship and we better take care of it or we're sort of like defeating ourselves. <laughs> no suffocate. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we're getting close toward our wrap-up time. I guess I'll move forward. Like, what made you want to – when did you finally decide to retire from being an astronaut? What made you want to – what made you have to decide you finally give up your passion and have to pursue new things in life? Yeah, that was a really difficult question. Um, I was on the very last shuttle mission, STS-135. And, of course, once the shuttles retired, they didn't need as many astronauts in the office because – Instead of flying, you know, 35 people a year, they're going to fly about four. And so I did some calculations and I thought, okay, if I stay here for 10 more years, I'll probably get to fly again on the space station, you know, for another, another, you know, four to six month mission. But for five of those years, I'll be wait, just waiting to get that next assignment because I'm mm -hmm. back at the line, at the back of the line, because I just flew, right? And so for that five, those five years, I looked at the kind of work that I would be doing and it was very similar to work that I'd already been doing. So mm -hmm. for that five years, I would be in kind of this stagnation holding pattern and I wouldn't be challenging myself or growing as a human being. And I knew that would make me crabby and I didn't want to, I, I like to challenge myself. I like to have, I like to keep learning. I like to be exposed to new things. And so I had to make a strategic decision that I didn't want to spend five years of my life in a in a holding pattern, even if meant I might get to fly in space again. And so intellectually, it made a huge amount of sense. Emotionally, it took me about a year to work through it because emotionally, I mean, I always wanted to be an astronaut. How could I not want to do this thing that I always loved? But I knew I would become kind of an unhappy person if I wasn't being challenged. So it was time for me to leave the office and, and go find new challenges. And so that's why I decided to leave. Wow. Okay. Man, did you say like, uh, so you said like emotionally it took a year. Like are you saying it, uh, you made the decision beforehand. It took you a whole year to finally come to terms and commit to uh, pursuing a further different path in the scientific field. Well, I, I did other stuff in a scientific field, but it was a battle between what I knew I needed to do and what I, what my I felt like oh but I've always been an astronaut but you're gonna if you stay you're gonna be unhappy for five years on a day-to-day -day basis and there's no guarantee you're gonna fly again and you're 48 and you know you want to do other things with your life but oh I love space I want to be in space I always want to be in space but you know you're gonna be unhappy for five you know so I was it was like this battle going back and forth okay so, so it's like it's like losing someone you really love it's like no yeah. but you have all the cool <laughs> memories to bring with it and if you keep yeah. thinking about it, you're just going to be sad about it, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, I was, I, I had to take the attitude that, you know, everything in, every, first of all, everything in life is transitory, right? And I was very fortunate to get to fly in space three times with wonderful people, had wonderful experiences, so lucky, so fortunate. And, you know, it was just time to move on to the next interesting opportunity. We're starting to come towards our deadline. Would you, want to wrap it up? Is there anything you want to tell our audience watching at home or? Yeah, I would just say, you know, I, I grew up again in a small town in Southern Illinois and I had no idea if, you know, being an astronaut, I was ever going to get to do it. It seemed like such an ambitious, you know, unusual goal for someone uh, where I came from. And I decided that that was my dream and I was going to try it. And I didn't want to look back on my life and think what if. And so I would encourage you, if you have a dream, that you should just go for it because you never know what's going to happen. And, you know, worst case, maybe things don't work out, but at least you know that you tried and you'll learn a lot of interesting things along the way, but don't just, don't just give up because it seems too hard or it, it seems like that's not something that someone like you could do or, or whatever. That's, you know, don't do that. Don't talk yourself out of it. Go for your dream. All right. Well, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, to our audience, thank you for, tuning in to the Astrological Podcast. I'm your host, Trisha Nusso, and uh, Godspeed. Excellent. Thank you for having me.